funding the deep tech and decentralized panel, uh, I'm sorry, decentralized science panel. And uh, this will have Rio Kawaguchi of ANRI, uh, Gus Dommel of Boost VC, and Estefano Panilla of Athena Dow. Woo! Thank you very much. Right, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> I think mean, so. Uh, the, the, I'm uh, Hiro, um, the moderator of this panel. Sorry, like uh, maybe I'm repeating the sessions, but uh, please let me introduce the, each uh, panelist and uh, we can start a little bit. Um, yeah, I can pass also too. Um, so from the front, um, Liho is like from a, a venture capitalist from Andy, um, and uh, she leads the investment in research driven deep tech startups um, as a senior associate. And also we have a Stefanos uh, from Athena Dial Science Co-Lead. So he is a, a postdoctoral researcher specializing in cardiovascular pharmacology at OC University and Dem Denmark, and a Baker Heart uh, Diabetes uh, Institute in Australia. And uh, lastly, we have uh, Gas Domaus. Uh, Gas is a, a principal at uh, Boost VC, uh, California-based deep tech VC fund. Uh, so he has been active also in a f uh, funding and a de uh, decentralized science community. So we ha all have it. Let's uh, welcome again uh, uh, all the uh, panelists. <laughs> so yeah, before actually we move to the what well, you know the, the uh, what the uh, decentralized science, the how they think that this is opportunity. I want e each of you introduce by yourself with your words. So yeah, Liho, please uh, please start. Okay, um, can you hear me? Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Riho. Um, I work at a venture capital fund in Japan. Um, it's Tokyo-based. Um, we focus on seed stage, and we um, not only invest in deep tech, but we also invest in internet companies. And we have like 280 portfolio companies, and we have been doing this for 12 years. And my main um, interest is is in deep tech, like robotics, AI, um, anything deep. Um, related to science, and um, currently I'm really interested in femtech, so I'm really um, happy to talk with you, Athena Dell. So nice to meet you, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, please, Stefano. Yeah, uh, my name is Stefano Pinilla. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Aarhus University and the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Australia. Um, and yeah, I joined Athena Dow uh, as a co-lead uh, in the science working group. In Athena Dow, what we do is we are, we are a Dow, so a decentralized community uh, worldwide. And what we do is uh, in, we fund uh, early stage uh, health research in women's health. Uh, I'm, by my background, I'm particularly interested in drug development, but we also fund uh, deep tech. We, we are having now a... a yeah, our, our run concerning like reproductive technologies, wearables. So we, we go a little bit broad in women's health. And uh, yeah, we are in the, in the DSI ecosystem in particularly using the molecule, uh, molecule protocol. And yeah, happy to, to share with you uh, my experience. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, praise Gus. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Gus. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, yeah, quickly on my background, uh, I'm from a very scientific and technical background originally, uh, so I did my PhD at Harvard and my postdoc at Stanford in a handful of different deep technologies. Uh, it ended up directing product and was a chief scientist for a health tech startup for some time before switching over uh, to the investor side. I'm a principal at Boost VC. We are a deep tech fund based in California, and we love to be the first investor uh, first check for, for people starting deep tech companies. And so we do everything from bio and health to space tech, materials, climate, energy, VR, crypto. We do, we do the whole deep tech spectrum. And we've done quite a bit of DSI stuff as well. So we've uh, backed some really great uh, DSI companies, including like Research Hub, Molecule, Cerebrum Dow, Hair Dow, and a couple others as well. Um, so really love the ecosystem. Thank you very much. So yeah, we all have uh, the introductions from the speakers. Uh, please let me start with the, uh, you know, that how uh, those panelists uh, see the these opportunities of this side. So, and because uh, we have also uh, the, uh, the uh, investors from the uh, deep tech, so we have somehow like a shared um, point of view, but this side somehow is quite different. So, uh, Gus, would you explain the, how did you find this side? And like, is it like a, 
through the crypto or blockchains, or you just found uh, DSI? How, how did you find uh, DSI from, uh, as uh, investors? Yeah, uh, great question. So I'll first just answer on me personally and then on right. as a fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I mentioned, I'm from a, uh, a scientific background originally. Right. And so I was always really interested in how you translate science to meaningful outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of the reason I became an investor is because I was interested in a lot of different scientific communities. And uh, that's what got me, like I said, switching over to the venture capital side. And when, when I learned about DSI and when we learned about it as a fund, we realized there was a really great opportunity uh, to kind of rethink how we do science in a way that can really benefit the world. And so, you know, we, we all talk about in DSI a lot of the really important things like, you know, realigning incentives more properly for the scientists and the people who discover, you know, really important things. Um, and yeah, and generally we, that, that's how we got interested at boost VC. We've been doing a lot of crypto for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. were, uh, early backers in companies like EtherScan, Unstoppable Domains, Coinbase and stuff like that. And so we had always been interested in crypto, but we also separately were very interested in, in, in deep tech as well. And, and DSI was a really incredible way to combine those two, uh, in a way that makes science more transparent and, and, uh, aligns incentives better. Yeah, thank you very much. That that part is I want I want to come back again, like your points, because uh, seemingly for me, at least maybe from also Rifo, the deep take and DSI somehow is quite like uh, kind of neighbor. But we also see like a, this lot of differences. You know, it's crypto cultures, and we don't know uh, what you know differences. And I also want to um, ask uh, the Stefano, the, uh, as a scientist, how you see this uh, you know Athena DAO, the DAO structure, that you know DSI uh, grant the Grant DAO, and how you get into uh, this uh, uh, crypto space? Yeah, would you explain uh, the, your experience? Yeah, I'm I'm very far from an OG in crypto. I was not. I, I knew about it, but I was not particularly interested in it uh, before design because yeah, financial stuff is not my strong point. I'm not particularly interested. I'm more like a science person. And when I heard about like, I think I heard first about Beta DAO. That was the first DAO mm -hmm. in the molecular ecosystem. And my research has to do with longevity, so I started like uh, getting involved with them and is when I learned about, okay, what does te this technology can do for science and to advance, to translate scientific knowledge into uh, new drugs, new treatments uh, for people. And I think for a scientist, it's actually been kind of comfortable to switch to DSI. I think it's like the ethos of open science and uh, this type of hacker culture actually fits quite well with most researchers. It doesn't fit well with like the structure, academic, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, establishment. Right. But in general, individual researchers are not very comfortable <laughs> in, in that superstructure, I would say. So it, it was very, very interesting to see the different solutions, both not only to funding, that is what we do at Athena DAO, mm -hmm. we focus in a very neglected area of research, that is women's health, uh, but there are also a lot of other problems that DSI is trying to solve for, like publication with Research Hub and, and other areas of funding. And I think that that is uh, something that scientists welcome very much when you talk to them and approach them mm -hmm. as a DAO. Hey, we are doing this. They, they really, really want to participate and want to contribute with their time. Uh, scientists are very used to work for free. Uh, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> so right, they, they right. always are like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure, we want to review, we want to uh, participate with you because we think it's very much needed to, to bring this uh, new, new community and, and different way of doing things into, into science. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. How, when, when did you actually find that this uh, beta DAO, the longevity supporting you know, DAO? I think it was 2021. 2021. So it, it was basically when, when the entire molecular ecosystem was starting uh, right, with, right. with beta DAO. And I got involved just before they, they did that initial auction. So a little bit from the beginning of, of, uh, of the protocol, yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, that's the timing, actually, the, the, this uh, entire um, molecular ecosystem the, they provide um, intellectual property NFT, like so-called IP NFT. Uh, we actually uh, can buy those NFT, uh, sorry. We uh, sorry, DAO fund the researchers, research labs, and instead of that, they will get the uh, IP NFT and community owns this uh, IP NFT, right? So this is the, the how uh, this DAO actually fund uh, the research and uh, DAO community actually sell this NFT to the pharmaceutical company. That is like kind of model, the, the framework they, um, they do. 
Is is it the same timing when Vue's VC invest started investing in these sites? Is it 2021 or uh, I when think, did? Yeah, it was around right around 2021 that I think we started. I think our first D site check would have been right around that time or shortly after. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Actually, we also have uh, uh, the speakers from um, uh, Research Hub. I'm also curious about, uh, so you guys also supporting uh, uh, Research Hub. Is that kind of similar timing or a little bit uh, the different uh, timing? Uh, yeah, it was a little bit after that, but uh, it was part of that first uh, round they had raised, yeah. And I'll let Patrick talk about uh, Research Hub. I won't steal his thunder, but yeah. Yeah, I see. So yeah, also, the cu uh, so let me like uh, uh, come back um, to the, the uh, point actually the differences between like a deep tech and uh, D side because um so you guys uh, boost BC uh, already started uh, investing investigating uh, investigating um, and investing um, uh, crypto space like a uh, coinbase and is scan this kind of stuff is is that the kind of uh, the, the kind of opportunity for you guys to you know like kind of seamless uh, connection with a D side, or how, so how how do you see the differences and the similarity between like uh, usual conventional deep tech and this D side? Do you see there any differences? Uh, yeah, good question. So uh, I guess two part answer. Uh, first is at Boost VC, like we the way we tend to think about things is we like to really empower people, and so like crypto was a way of empowering everyone financially, and we've backed a lot of other. Uh, different industries that empower people in different ways. Uh, and, and what's cool about DSI is that it's empowering scientists uh, and, and researchers and, and all folks like that to uh, more properly benefit from the work they do and for them to work outside of the traditional systems that uh, are incredible in some ways but handcuff you and, uh, and hold you back in many ways too. And so uh, in that regard, like that's why you know we get excited about those things. And on, on, on the deep tech front, like the way we define deep tech is a little more broad than maybe other people do, but it's anyone who's really using like some sort of strong innovation to solve some of the world's hardest problems. Uh, and what's really cool about DSI is it's very tangential in that in DSI, uh, you know, it's a system to empower people to solve the hardest problems outside of traditional kind of funding and, and other you know, scientific work. And so they're, th in some ways, they're extremely overlapped. Uh, and in most ways, I, I would say even they're extremely overlapped, yeah. Yeah, I see this is like, uh, for me, maybe from the maybe Japanese perspective, it's, it's really, um, really huge risk at the same time. So we don't know really what's coming out of it. And so maybe like, I don't know, the default, how, how do you see the, you know, their investment styles and uh, because it's seemingly like it's a way, you know, we don't know like what's coming out of it uh, from yeah. the, this uh, uh, investment, uh, investing uh, DSI. Yeah, actually, um, to be honest, in Japan, DSI is not like mm -hmm. um, a common knowledge. Right, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's a totally, it's just uh, me saying, you know, <laughs> this is something exciting. So it's just, I'm, I'm not kind of mediators, like you know, Gas yeah, and Stefanos so, with the- um, um, In Deep Dick's, um investment field in Japan, um, we didn't, we don't hear the DSI word actually, mm -hmm. but we know the word DAO because of um, several years ago, the Web3 movement came to Japan too, and we yeah, understand the um, word, but we don't understand the like DSI DAO, DAO thing. And I'm curious, um, um, can I ask you one thing? Um, how do you evaluate the, um, how the DAO earns money like compared to like deep tech startups and DSI? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's a good question, uh, and it's one that we, I think everyone uh, who is investing into DAOs as like a venture capitalist has struggled with, is understanding how, how like the DAOs scale in a venture mm -hmm. manner. Uh, and that's something we've, we've been really talking about and thinking about internally because the, the reality is in, when you're investing in a DAO, you're really investing into a fund. You're kind of a fund of a fund in some ways. And it's interesting because, you know, in any startup, the most important thing uh, at the, especially at the earliest stages are the people that are part of it, the project. And so with, even with DAOs, even though it's decentralized, 
decentralizing the, the ecosystem that they're building, the people are still so important, those early people, because they're the ones who are going to galvanize the community and stuff. And so we still try to focus on, like, who are the people that are really important to the, the DAO and how are they galvanizing the community around them. Uh, and that's how we think about it. But the reality is it's different, especially because there's also certain restrictions around holding, like, if you're a venture capitalist holding so many tokens, you only can hold so much unless you're an RIA. Uh, but yeah, long story short, it's something we're thinking a lot about is how does that, uh, how do DAOs like scale in a very venture way? I see. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask you Hiro too. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, is there like restrictions in Japan to if you want to start a de um, DeSci DAO? Like yeah, yeah. So th that's a good point. Um, that kind of difficulties in Japan about um, about DeSci, as I think it did, um, Two, two perspectives. One is that like, most of the scientists don't know much about you know that's uh, how this um, uh, blockchain systems works, and like uh, not so many people knows about this you know, crypto trend itself. Uh, it's kind of hard to catch their attention. That that is one one really big uh, dif uh, difficulties. And another point would be about the token uh, um, launch is really uh, difficult in Japan. So if you have uh, have a token launch, then immediately your amount of the uh, money money in a DAO will be taxed. So you have to pay immediately, even though you just have our uh, tokens and uh, sorry, monies, but you want to use it for your own uh, business. But uh, at the very beginning, you have to pay for the taxes with this uh, amount of money you get from the community. That, that is a huge difficulty. So I want to uh, slightly um, shift the scope of DSI. So I want to expand. That's why actually I'm also having uh, this event, funding the commons together. Um, since uh, science is also um, kind of um, public goods, right? And decentralized science is, uh, I think, a way to um, have our new findings uh, with decentralized community. So not necessarily we should utilize um, blockchains or these uh, token incentives. But it's it's much I think efficient if you have it uh, in the end. But um, uh, so in that way, maybe we can slightly um, tune the definition of DSI and maybe adapt uh, to uh, Japanese ecosystem. That's actually what I intended to do, and this is a kind of difficult part <laughs> in a some sense. Um, that's why like I wanted to have the gas and Stefano the actual experience you guys had uh, pre um, last couple of years. Uh, so that, that is the kind of thing so I'm actually I'm doing Thank it. You. So, so for now, right. for, uh, uh, um, as a Jap for a Japanese scientist mm -hmm. who wants to like be in a decide DAO, right. you have to um, search for the foreign, foreign DAO. Yeah, or? yes, absolutely, okay. yeah. But, and Estefano said, uh, yeah, we were talk talking mm -hmm. yes. and Estefano said that um, a lot of scientists from abroad, like from all over the world, um, is gathering in your DAO, right? H how do you like, um, how did they find your Athena DAO? Uh, that's basically the work we've been doing for the first uh, two years. So the first, the, the first years of the DAO is basically building a relationship with the different uh, research communities uh, we are trying to, uh, to fund. In our case, uh, women's health, we have a lot of, uh, normally the people that join a DAO at the beginning are uh, PhD students, uh, people a little bit more junior, but they have a lot of uh, network, they know people in the field. So through them and through one-on-one, -on -one, we build those relationships, we talk to them, we see what they need, because it's also what we're interested in funding, okay, where, uh, I I'm gonna talk uh, later about a DAO more, more deeply and, and how our process is, but before we, um, do a call for applications, we basically do research in what is needed. Um, and we find the bottlenecks, what are, on, okay, what, what are the needs of the scientists working in, in this field? Uh, so it's, it's basically one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we just go and, and look for them, attend conferences. Uh, most members of the DAO in the science and uh, working group are also scientists in the field, so they attend conferences because of their work, uh, they have their own uh, networks, so that's, that's more or less how we work. And, Commenting on, on what uh, Gus said uh, before, I think the value of a DAO is not that much of a fund, uh, because again, we don't have that much big pockets. We work more like a crowdfunding uh, type of organization. Mm -hmm. I think it's more valuable as a, uh, we, we are trying to think about uh, ourselves as a incubator of, of new projects and startups. So we connect 
scientists, with uh, entrepreneurs, people in crypto that want to start things in women's health, in our case. Uh, and that's where we see the main value, connecting scientists with a huge community of people. Because scientists, most of the time, they want to do science, and that, that's what they want to do and what to focus on. Okay, I have this idea, I think it, it, it's gonna have an impact in women's health, but I don't know how to start a company, I don't know how to you know, take a project from my lab bench that has very promising data into uh, the patients, and that's where we come in. We provide some initial funding, um, and we incubate and connect the researcher to, uh, to other people to bring the project forward, or even like co-spin uh, out something with the scientists. We have a couple of projects in that direction. Yeah, I have a question uh, related to that. Actually, um, so if you, so DAO is kind of global, you know, communities, and at the same time, we have a lot of um, local restriction, like a legal system, for example. I was curious about as so when you, you know, uh, contact with some uh, people in a different countries, each countries and also each university has a district. How how do you convince that? How how did you get involved? Because uh, you know, you can't just give a token to the university, right? How how does this work? I'm all, um, curious about it. Uh, that's an excellent question, and it's precisely one of my main roles in the right, right now. Is, oh, it's cool. <laughs> doing that with right. universities because I have some experience with uh, tech transfer offices mm -hmm. that are the part of the university uh, that deals with uh, spinning out projects or uh, yeah, handling the uh, intellectual property rights that the university produces. Mm -hmm. And it's actually surprisingly simple because even though uh, there are a lot of like local regulations. What we do with universities is a kind of a very standard procedure. M almost all universities have what is called like sponsor research agreement. Mm -hmm. That is a way for private companies or private institutions to fund research mm -hmm. in exchange for something. Mm -hmm. Normally IP or sometimes, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna fund for you to produce mm -hmm. like a paper for us or like a report for us. Mm -hmm. In our case, what we do is funding them in exchange for uh, rights to the future IP that the project generates. Even like it can be ownership or uh, just licensing. Uh, so most universities all over the world have like a structure already right. mm -hmm. and we just do it like tailor it to what they normally have. We have of course our, uh, our uh, templates but, mm -hmm. but we adapt to to this format that most universities have all around the world. Yeah. Ah, wow, that, that's uh, very great to know because um, um, so once actually I contacted some of the people in Japan, so it's, they said like, oh, it's very hard <laughs> for us to do it in Japan, maybe local, yeah. Yeah, what, what we try to do is like the universities don't have to interact directly with, mm -hmm. with uh, crypto or with Web3 because we don't think, like we use Web3 as a tool uh, to fund science and to advance science. We don't want the tool to be the center. And most universities, uh, in some countries, they are even like, I'm, I'm originally from Spain, and we have found a couple of Spanish projects, and most universities in Spain are part of the government, and the government doesn't want to touch a wallet. <laughs> <laughs> like, they don't want to get mixed. So we make sure that we are the intermediary, and they receive cash, they can do everything normally, and we just uh, are kind of like the interface between Web3 and uh, the university. Um, of course, we offer the possibility of the, some, some researchers want to get involved in Web3 and no, yeah, I want to hold tokens, I want to vote, I want to participate in the community, and some others are like, you know, you, you hold the tokens for me, I will, I will advise you uh, how to vote, but I don't want to hold them myself or I'm not that interested, I just, yeah. And they receive uh, regular cash, so that makes everything <laughs> possible, basically. If, if not, it would be very difficult. It's very cool. You guys have any questions to the other panelists? Uh, um, if not, then I can. I want to <laughs> ask Gus. Uh, so you you see the multiple players in a in a TISA ecosystem. Uh, do you, uh, can you share the, your perspective on like um, uh, you know the kind of experiences like of TISA and what the difficulties and like uh, uh, something you learn from TISA? Like uh, maybe like this would work some aspect. Some aspect didn't work. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so, you know, we've been doing this for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and I think with any new movement, uh, there's always a period where the movement's trying to figure out what it is, and, and, you're, and the right people are, are being onboarded onto it. And what I mean by that is, like, uh, early DSI, it's still very early. Mm -hmm. Like, DSI relative to everything else we pretty much invest in, and most deep tech investors invest in, DSI is still very, like, it's in infancy stages. 
And the, the, I think the big challenge for DSI is, uh, you know, scientists are really brilliant and great. You know, I'm a former scientist myself, but translating that to tangible products and outcomes can sometimes be uh, a headache. And, and it's easy for, I think, scientists to lose sight of that. And I think in DSI, I think the kind of the, the really important next piece for DSI is going to be, okay, you know, there's these really great DAOs spinning up. There's some other really great companies that are spinning up. But, you know, what tangible pro like products and what tangible uh, problems are we solving for scientists and not losing sight of that? Um, because I think it's easy to lose sight of that, uh, specifically within this uh, this community, and I say that as someone who is a scientist originally, uh, and so I think like that's kind of like the, where the, the I guess kind of hurdles seem to be right now, and I think also just the reality is science is a uh, it's a a field that has a lot of traditions and is stuck in certain ways, and I think onboarding those classical institutions onto these kind of new waves of doing things is interesting, but I think why DSI will, you know, regardless of that, you know, do something really special and why we're really excited about it is because it gives people and scientists a different ecosystem to work with and to do their work. And so in terms of like you asked about the prospects for DSI, I think in the next couple of years, you know, we've seen a lot of funding starting to go uh, via these DAOs into great projects. And, uh, and that's really exciting. And so I think if we can continue to, you know, excite scientists to work outside of the traditional ecosystems and, and you know, institutions that they work in, I think some great things will happen. It'll just take some time. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to have a kind of uh, detailed questions because uh, usually like uh, investment timing is 10 years. Is it the same in uh, with the BC and also the DSI system? Because you say that uh, maybe we have very long, long, uh, um, you know, like yeah. uh, returns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, is that, is that do you have to also convince the um, the your LP like additionally or like how how do you manage that? That is the one on C. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and it's a it's a broader question too about deep tech, not just for DSI, I think, uh, especially at the earliest stages. So we invest, you know, first check into a company, and anything deep tech and DSI included as kind of a piece of that. It just takes a long time to build, and and so we know at the stage we're investing, which is so early to when that company, you know, might have an exit, for example, uh, it can be 10, 15 years. And so you're very right about that. And for us, like DSI is no different for that. Like DSI is still going to be, uh, it's still gonna be just like the rest of Deep Tech where it's gonna take a lot of time for these things to be realized. And at Boost VC, we're totally okay with that. And the, the, you asked about the LP, so for those who don't know, LPs are, they're limited partners. They're the people who give us the capital to invest essentially and you know when they give us a capital it's tied up you know with the fund for 10 to 15 years and so it's about finding people who resonate with that mission and aren't just looking for a quick exit uh, and so finding people that align with our values uh, is really important because these things take a lo long time and DSI is, is no different than that for sure but the impact is obviously immense when right. it does land. Excellent. That's uh, what I wanted to. Okay, we are running out of time, but before, do you have anything you want to add? Or uh, if not, then we can just, uh, you know, uh, have a word, you guys, few words, like about, like, you know, like uh, what to expect the uh, next couple of years. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted to comment one thing on what Gas said. Um, yeah, the, um, the LPs. Um, how the LP thinks is like really um, like crucial for us VCs. So we actually um, raised a fund called Green Fund. It's a climate tech focused fund, and um, the difference is, is that it is like 15 years um, limit fund. So um, average venture capital fund is 10 years, but it's longer. And so the LPs um, understand that like climate tech. Um, startups takes long, long time, so it's important for yeah. Like, I I don't think it, this is this war is appropriate, but like educate the LPs to like understand the the um, sciences and the startups. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe a few words from the Stefanos and Gas, and we will finish. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build a little bit in what Gas said because I think it's one of the main challenges of of uh, bio DAOs right now that is uh, it's good to know that VCs are looking in the like long term and like 10 years in the future uh, and that's one of the problems with crypto investors that is where a lot of our money comes from that is that 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 world is used to much quicker return on investment 
and and to be in this interface between like the very fast pace uh, world of crypto where you just like buy and sell and very very quick and you expect a, a quick return with uh, science, especially drug development, where yeah, in ten years you're lucky if you have like, if, if you're starting to go into humans, that that's a quick project actually. So so uh, keep the keep the community and and the retail investors interested in in science for uh, such a long period. I think it's one of the uh, challenges that we're working on, and we need to to learn uh, how to manage because yeah it's i i think it's uh, one of the things in, in the future that can either make or break the the, the field of biodows yeah thank you very much so just yeah yeah and just w one closing word i guess uh yeah th at boost we see like i said we're, we're super interested in DSI because we know uh it can really impact the world in an immense way you know if people can figure out how to realign incentives and do all these incredible things that we talk about in DSI. Uh, and so, like, cheers to everyone who's building in this space and and is trying to, you know, do something special. And at Boost VC, like I said, we're, we're always looking to, to invest in great people and great companies. So if anyone is building anything exciting in DSI or just deep tech, never hesitate to reach out and find me or re reach out to me on LinkedIn or whatever, for sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so let's close uh, this panel. Thank you very much for this link.